Welcome back to The Heat. My guest is Tom Miller. We're talking about his book. It's called China's Asian Dream. We were touching on the issue of investment just now, Tom. Can I get you to expand on that a little bit more and to say to you that you're on your own here because this is a very complicated issue. In a few sentences, if you will, how is China going to pay for the expansion that it has in mind? Right, um, as you say, it is complicated and there are lots of numbers um, out there and you hear a lot of headlines with you know, crazy investment figures on them and um, you know, I, I think they can be taken with a pinch of salt. No one knows how much money is going to go in, into this project. I think it's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is that actually um, often um, China is portrayed as the investor, i.e. Um, a country or actually more accurately you know, Chinese businesses taking equity stakes abroad and in most cases that is that is not true so it's more a question of China lending lots of money than it is a question of China making investments now okay. of course it's making investments as well but most of this will will come in the form um, of loans and also it's important to point out too that you know this cannot work China cannot build a new Silk Road without the cooperation of other countries too so they are also investing um, their, um, um, their own money in these projects too. Having said all that, China does have lots of money. Now why? The reason it has lots of money is that it has lots of people. So the Chinese population is about 1.4 billion. It has a very high savings rate. Those people put a, put a lot of money in Chinese banks. That means there's lots of money available. Um, and you know, the way that China um, makes its loans, it's sometimes it goes through commercial banks, but the much bigger um, um, means is through its policy banks. So these are state-owned banks that are specifically designed to do the work of government policy. So we're talking about um, China Export-Import Bank, talking about China Development Bank. Um, and they have huge amounts of money. We're talking about hundreds of billions um, of dollars on their balance sheet. Um, and, you know, they can lend a significant chunk of that abroad. Okay. Um, putting an actual figure on it is very, very difficult um, indeed. But um, we at my company, Gavkar Research, we estimate that China could probably finance in the region of $100 billion um, of loans and investment along the Belt and the Road okay. um, every year. Well, Tom, let's talk about the Belt and the Road because it is President Xi's big initiative. And here on CGTN, we spend a lot of time talking about it, as you would understand. I love the fact that in your book you have a, uh, an alternative way of explaining it to people, which is basically it is China lending, China development, and Chinese engineering companies doing stuff, you say, around the world. That's a great way of looking at it. But what is the belt and what is the road? Right, so in the most simple terms, the belt stands for the Silk Road Economic Belt. And that's all about building connectivity, whether in terms of transport, in terms of pipelines, in terms of power grids, um, fiber optic cables, you name it, across Eurasia. So from China, across Central Asia, into Eastern Europe. That's the belt. The road stands for the 21st century maritime Silk Road. It's a mouthful. Um, and it may be called a road, but actually it happens at sea. That makes more sense in Chinese than it does in English, admittedly. Um, and that's about building, again, better con connectivity in terms of new, new ports and new sea links from the Chinese coast down through the South China Sea into the Pacific. But more um, specifically, I think, a, a bigger part of this is west through the Indian Ocean and um, through the Arabian Sea, that sort of area, and into the Mediterranean Sea to Europe. And although that was a brilliant explanation, and I thank you for it, I, I think it's fair to say that many international commentators also say that Belt and Road, as set out, is also vague. Why do you think they might have left it rather open-ended? Um, yes, yeah, so I, I, it is deliberately broad. Um, I think it's because there is no list of projects that they want to complete. And I think there is this kind of notion that, you know, there should be a checklist and we can mm. check, check this list off to see, you know, what has been done. Um, it's not about that. This is much more about a broad set of kind of policy aims. And, you know, Beijing doesn't want to tie itself down. Um, and also, I think, you know, when this policy came out, it hadn't really been thought through fully, which is often the way Beijing does things. Um, and, um, you know, what, what it actually looks like on, on the ground, no one can know for sure, because it's a very, very long-term policy. You know, the, the specifics will depend on the vagaries of, of sort of deals made between businesses um, and government. Some will work, some won't work. Mm -hmm. So I think it's impossible to say exactly what it is. It, it is, it is in, 
it is most basically just a huge development push over China's borders um, and across the Eurasian con continent. Yes, it is an audacious plan, and uh, there is a risk, I think, that if it doesn't work, then it may backfire on some of the Chinese leadership. But we, we won't know that for many years, though, will we? Um, I, I, mean, I, I think, you know, there, there has been pushback already. I mean, there's pushback yes. at home. There's plenty of criticism, actually, um, in the Chinese media and, you know, in Chinese think tanks um, and in academia about, about aspects um, of this policy. Um, and a lot of that relates to what's been going on on the ground in some of the countries in which China's working. And, um, you know, I'll I take two examples, I think. Um, you know, one, if you look at Burma, Myanmar, uh, you know, China was doing uh, quite a lot of things. And when I say China, I mean Chinese state-owned enterprises a few years ago. And um, when the military junta there um, 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 dissolved itself and suddenly there was a new um, government in power, um, they decided to shut down some of those big infrastructure projects. So particularly the three point something billion dollar Mietzone Dam is a, is a great example. Also, um, China was planning to build a new railway um, to the coast and that was a sort of 20 billion dollar plan and you know that's been put on a hold indefinitely. So you know, it, you know these things don't always work. But I think um, more recently Pakistan is a great example you know, China is building the so-called, along with Pakistan, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. You know, this involves building um, a pipeline from the Chinese-Pakistan border that winds its way through Kashmir and then down through Pakistan to the Arabian Sea at Gwadar port. And along with that, you know, it's planning on building more roads. Um, there, are, there are plans for industrial zones, agriculture, you name it. The problem, though, is that, you know, as everyone knows, Pakistan is a dangerous place. Um, in, in May, two Chinese teachers were killed in, in Quetta. Um, uh, the Pakistani government uh, promises a force of 15,000 security guards to keep Chinese workmen safe. But, of course, a lot can go wrong and a lot of money can be lost. Um, and, you know, China will suffer from criticism abroad um, from people who worry that it shouldn't be, you know, doing things on, on, on their soil. But it will also suffer at home when, you know, when, when people get angry about people losing their lives or yes. China losing yes. money. You know, there's plenty, there's plenty that can go wrong here. So it's a big learning curve for Beijing as well as everybody else in many respects. In the meantime, Tom, there are 1,700 trains a year going across Eurasia taking stuff with them and China is helping to build infrastructure along that silk route and the belt there that is useful to people so goodwill is being built up all the time right yes no I'm, I, th I think it's definitely a mixture and you know there are plenty of people in the West uh, in the US and in Europe um, often cynical old men um, who claim that none of this is real that you know this project is, is only so much puffery now, there's some truth in what they say, in that the Belt and Road Initiative, which, which is what it's called in English, officially, mm. um, it's not entirely new in that a lot of these projects were planned or some had even been started before Xi Jinping even started talking about it, OK? Right. But what Xi Jinping has done um, is to take a lot of sort of ad hoc projects and put a lot of political will and more financial power uh, behind them. And real stuff is happening. So, you know, as you say, um, there are more and more trains trundling from, you know, China's east coast across the Chinese mainland and then across Central Asia into Eastern Europe. Um, and there are also more and more trains now, um, not, not, not necessarily going, going to Europe, but also to Afghanistan, to Iran um, as well. Um, and the number of train, trains leaving China and arriving in Europe doubled last year, expected to keep on rising as well. Now, this is not an economic game changer for Europe. You know, um, this, is in, this is a few containers. You know, many, many millions of containers leave China every day on ships. So 1,700 isn't a big deal in terms of the economics of it. But it is a big deal, um, I think, for some of the smaller countries um, that it's serving. And, you know, this is just a start. And, you know, it's hard to know exactly where this will go. As well. I say, it's a very, very long-term policy. But there are many, many other sort of infrastructure plans, too. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a complex, ever-evolving beast. Well, you say in the book that the Chinese call this a community of common destiny through economic growth. But you also make the point in the book that others those old grey men who never travel that you were talking about certainly make the point that this could also be about geopolitical control and that what's going on is somewhat of a smokescreen for that. So what are your conclusions when you take those two arguments side by side? Right, well, 
I think what China's doing is about many things. Now, certainly, I think it's, it's, it's about economics. Um, that's about um, fostering new markets for, for Chinese goods abroad. That's one thing. Another thing is that China wants to help develop its own underdeveloped border regions. So in places like Yunnan, in Xinjiang, in Heilongjiang, Guangxi, those sorts of places. And one way it can do that is to sort of push development over the borders and to try and to make those bordering countries richer too, so they can do business with them. So it's certainly about um, economics. But it's also um, about um, sort of strategic aims as well. There's no doubt about that. And you know, that includes um, resources. So China wants to buy resources resources from places like, say, Kazakhstan. It also wants to create um, alternative import routes for, for things like oil and gas, say, for example, from Russia, from, from Central Asia, um, new pipelines across Burma so that um, oil tankers can dock in the Bay of Bengal and send, their, and send their oil into China that way too. So there's a, a strategic aim there too. But it does go beyond that, and there is an element of geo geopolitics here, of course. Um, you know, even if China wasn't specifically aiming um, to become, you know, a, a kind of a sort of dominant power in Asia, which I think it is, I think that economic power naturally translates in time into geopolitical power. You know, so if China is doing business with places like Laos and Cambodia, if more importantly it's building their, 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 um, their infrastructure out, so it's building their roads, for example, it's building railways, then of course, you know, it wants something in return for that. You know, those countries are going to support China on things like its core interests. So when it comes to sensitive topics like Tibet or Taiwan or Xinjiang, those sort of issues of sovereignty. So there's no doubt there is a strategic element here. And then you have countries like India, which are, you know, it's obviously a strategic competitor of China's, um, at least that's how India sees it. And, you know, it sees China building ports um, in the um, Indian Ocean. You know, China has ports, I say China, Chinese companies operate ports in Colombo and Hambantota in Sri Lanka. Um, you know, China has built a new port at Gwadar in Pakistan on, on the Arabian Sea. It you know, also has access to Karachi as well. Um, it also has a port at Chalk Pew um, in, um, in, um, in, uh, in Burma. And it has interests in other parts um, in the Indian Ocean as well. And the well, way India views this is that China is trying to build a string of pearls around the neck of Mother India. You know? And there's no doubt that Chinese subs are operating in the Indian Ocean. And it makes, I'm not surprised that India worries about it. Do I think they exaggerate the threat? Yes, I do. But, um, you know, it, of course, to them, it looks like a smokescreen for strategic control because a lot of what China's Tom. doing is not commercial, you know? Yeah. Whichever way you slice and dice this, all of this means that China is being spoken about in the international community and in the international institutions and in the international media in a way like never before. So this is not going to go away, is it? Um, it'd be very surprising if it did. Um, you know, China has an 11 trillion plus dollar economy. The US is about 18. But China is, you know, it's very much number two. Its economy is twice as big um, as, as the third um, biggest economy. That's Japan. Um, and the Chinese economy has, has slowed somewhat. It will continue slowing. But, you know, it's still growing. And it's growing off an ever larger base. So, of course, its economic power is growing. And with that, its geopolitical power will grow as well. And you know, China has clearly, or Xi Jinping has clearly made a decision that China now should play a much bigger role on the international stage. So, okay. of course, its power is going to grow. You know, China is rising. Tom Miller in Oxford in the UK, thank you very much indeed for joining us on this edition of the programme. Tom's book is China's Asian Dreams. Here it is, published by Z Books of London. And that's it for this edition of The Heat, but the conversation continues online. Chat with us about this or any other show on Twitter. We're at CGTN America, or you can visit us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash CGTN America. I'm John Terrett in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.